Au début, il faut que je m'excuse, je vais parler comme Stéphane a indiqué en anglais. C'est une langue primitive d'outre-manche euh, pour les sociétés infantiles qui sont obsédées par les questions de succession et de mort. Et c'est un grand honneur, mais c'est aussi un grand plaisir d'être ici parmi vous à l'École Normale Supérieure aujourd'hui, surtout. Je me traite comme un espèce de réfugié d'un petit rocher insulaire euh, juste à côté de l'Europe. Euh, donc c'est un privilège et l'invitation, c'est vraiment formidable que j'ai reçu. So now I'll start speaking in English. Um, so I was told, I did not choose this, that I would be delivering the conference inaugural of this series. And that imposes certain burdens on the speaker. In particular, the theme of the series, as you know better than I do, is Actualité des Historiographies Transnationales Globales. And quite a lot of what I am going to discuss is critical with respect to that historiography, obviously. In particular, if you have been conscientious enough to look at the opening statement of the master of which this is a seminar, you will remember that the claim is made, and it's a very common claim, and it's a claim to which I absolutely subscribe, that for the last ooh, 20 years, say, the global turn has destabilized and revolutionized all sorts of work in the fields of comparative history. And I would say, especially in my small field, history of science. The argument is often made that the global approach in history in general was developed over the last 20 or 30 years at a certain kind of intersection an intersection between comparative, colonial, and imperial histories, especially around themes of travel, of crossing borders, of infringements and violations, and interconnections. Now, the first point that I want to try and get across in what I'm going to talk about now is that that claim that this takes place at a certain set of intersections and that it is very recent strikes an historian of science as somewhat odd or baffling or strange. There are several reasons for this. One is the function of the term global within the history of the sciences, which is what I want to talk about first. The term global, global, in the expansive senses now intended, is indeed impressively recent. Initially, both in French, the language of the mind, and English, the language of the body, to be global initially meant to be shaped like a globe. It meant to be rounded. So global things in the first modernity, 
were lenses, stars, bubbles, pearls, eyes, and of course in England, theatres. <laughs> Global did not mean any of the things it now means. It was only during the long 19th century that global gradually came to mean the more expansive sense that we now use. So in French, it was only from the 19th century that global meant quelque chose qui est pris en bloc, for example. It referred to un sujet considéré dans son ensemble. It was then adopted very significantly, I will not have time to go into this, from French into English. So the French invented global and then the English adopted it. A bit like garlic in that respect. And it was first used in English in any of these senses right at the end of the 19th century, from the 1880s and 90s. And the uses are extremely significant, but tragically I don't have time to go into them. The philology here is very interesting indeed. So, for example, almost the first use of the word global in English is global income tax. Impôt global, which was a French concept introduced, as you know better than I do, in the 1890s under the Third Republic and much denounced in the English newspapers. And that's how the word global begins to enter English. So there's a lot to think about there, right? But the point I want to try and get across to you is that global plays an absolutely crucial role in the long history of the sciences in Europe. Because global extent was taken to mean simultaneously the principal virtue of forms of knowledge which adequately represented nature in other words, if they were adequate, they were necessarily global. They worked everywhere. And at the same time, a sign that those forms of knowledge did not depend on local circumstance. So it wasn't just in the canonical epistemology that the sciences had to be global because their claims had to work everywhere. It was also, perhaps even more importantly, that the sciences must not in any significant way, it was argued, depend on the specifics of a particular site. Now clearly there's a relation between those two claims, but they are not the same claim. And that will matter to what I'm going to say next. Now, for this reason, many historians of science, I would say especially in Anglophonie, but not only there, have long assumed that the history of the global, the history of the global, not global history, the history of that notion, is a synonym for the history of the sciences. They are the same thing. That was the assumption that was made by, for example, the people who had the misfortune to teach me. <laughs> and that was to restate in bald outline the kinds of claims you see in my first slide. This is an image from the natural philosopher Joseph Priestley's new chart of history made in 1769 and dedicated, of course, to Benjamin Franklin, which set out the history of the world for both pedagogical and political purposes, in which the sciences, you can't see this, but if you look closely at the chart, 
it's the sciences that both represent and drive the global extent of what he was pleased to call civilization. The whole business of natural philosophy, diversified as it is, is but one. It being one and the same great scheme, all philosophers, you're to understand roughly all scientists, of all ages and nations have been conducting it from the beginning of the world. So a global, a universal history, which is above all the history of the sciences. We don't see quite the same in Buffon, but something that's clearly in dialogue with that sort of claim. In Buffon, notably in Époque de la Nature, one is offered not only a history of the globe, obviously, one is also offered a history of knowledge of the globe. That knowledge Buffon and his colleagues, like Jean-Sylvain Bailly, argued began in northern Asia, Asia, in Siberia, in the immemorial past, and diffused right across the planet. C'est dans les contrées septentrionales de l'Asie que s'est élevé la tige des connaissances de l'homme, et c'est sur ce trône de l'arbre de la science que s'est élevé le trône de sa puissance. And what Buffon adds very significantly for my story is that that great truth, that the sciences of the globe were invented in one place and have become universal and global, is evidenced not only by what we would call history, but by natural history and ancient astronomy. In other words, the development of the sciences, Buffon very influentially argues, is global in principle, and it provides evidence for globalism. Now, for a very long time, when historians like me say a very long time, we normally mean 250 years. So for a very long time, um, that notion of the sciences as global and as showing their own global extent has in fact, I think, been the dominant theme in the historiography of both the natural and the human sciences. You can see it wonderfully well in the work of the great Belgian reformer, visionary, exhibition organizer, Paul Otle, who uh, in 1935 produced a remarkable work, Atlas Monde, um, which, as you see, offered an absolutely eschatological vision of world unity in the name of universal peace with the sciences at the center. And not coincidentally, Otle invented a new word to describe this project coming from his historiography of science. The new word was mondialisation, a word that does not exist in English and has no English translation very significantly. So, mondial and mondialisation exist in many languages, but not in English and certainly not in American English. The project was in close dialogue with other visionary projects of the interwar period. On the one hand, Otto Neurath's uh, Social and Economic Museum, founded in Vienna, then moving to Amsterdam and then to the United Kingdom in the 1920s and 30s. And in our field, above all, uh, the specific discipline of the history of science, which at least in the English-speaking world was founded by another Belgian patriarch, George Sarton from Ghent, who moved from Belgium to the United States and for whom, I quote, the history of science is the only history 
that can illustrate the progress of humans. He uses more sexist language than that, which I'm not going to use. So it is, in my view, precisely the critique, if not the tough-minded abandonment of this kind of global in the writing of comparative and connected histories that seems to me worth emphasizing. Scientific knowledge is now, by and large, taken to be not global, but mundane. It depends on no especially genial or no excessively rational methods. It relies on locality, on the situated work of trials and assays of persuasion and credibility. It's embodied in ingenious and artful hardware and work. It exploits and reinforces organized places where the labor is done and between which it moves. Now, for all those reasons, global and the global as an object of historical inquiry becomes a puzzle, an enigma, rather than a premise or a principle. And that, I think, is an extremely striking feature of the relationship between the historiography of the sciences, as practiced by this particular community, and the very notion of the global, not only as a theme in history, but as a problem of analysis. This clearly has some quite important methodological and historiographic implications. One, sorry, the first. Think about the relation with the historiography of the colony and of empire. Too often, the empire, the imperial, and the colonial are taken as synonyms for the global or the mondial. And they are not. Not at all. Yet, in the writing of work like that of David Wade Chambers and Richard Gillespie, it's argued that science, as they put it, became a metaphor for what empire might become. More interestingly, much more interestingly, in his careful rejection of the notion that imperial knowledges were a European monopoly, and in his argument that European sciences need disaggregation, Sujit Siva Sundaram, who will be speaking in this series um, in November? December. December? Sometime later on, anyway. You'll love it. Sujit has argued that sciences were I'm quoting from him, molded by empire, interwoven with empire in complicated ways, inflected through empire. And clearly, the historiographic debate needs to treat with enormous care the relation between histories of empire and histories of the global. They don't point in the same direction, and they are certainly not synonymous. Second point, a certain kind of chronology has been introduced as a result of this relationship between writing histories of the very concept of the global and pursuing a more localist, a more situated set of histories of the sciences. This chronology has focused a great deal on the conjuncture of 1800, of the late 18th and early 19th century. This is quite striking because it raises certain questions, very familiar questions to you, I'm sure, about antecedents and precedents for the kind of global world-making 
that I'm going to be discussing in the rest of my talk. The activity that particularly interests me is illustrated here. It's what I'm going to call survey science. Now, again, the term survey in English is ambiguous in ways that its French cognates capture very nicely indeed. Um, so if one thinks about a word like levé, which originally meant the various acts of getting up in the morning, if that's when you get up, I don't know. I sometimes do that. And of accumulating. It only came to mean making a map from the early 1800s. And then it absolutely was used in those terms and then adopted by the English as well. Exactly the same chronology applies to the key word enquête, which was a word in jurisprudence until about 1800, and then it came to mean something more like um, general studies of social or economic and physical problems. And the same is true of the word bilan, which is a fiscal word, um, meaning giving an account in finance. How much money have you got? That's what a bilan was. It comes from balance, bilancio. Um, it only meant anything like a résultat global from the middle of the 1800s. So it has exactly the same kind of chronology as the word global itself, and that's obviously very suggestive. So what interests me are survey sciences. It's often translated as science d'enquête. <coughs> survey sciences look, if you map them as I've done here, like this. They are coordinated, they both extract and distribute forms of information and knowledge, they are collaborative, and they are distinctly transnational in ways that are very interesting to pursue. So what I've mapped here are the two European projects to observe the, the transit of the planet Venus, or the apparent transit of the planet Venus across the face of the Sun, a set of coordinated observations that would allow one to calculate the distance from the Earth to the Sun, the so-called unité astronomique. Venus transited the Sun in 1761 and again in 1769, the expeditions to observe this transit are marked in red for 61 and in purple for 69. And you begin to see some of the first coordinated general global survey projects of this kind. At almost exactly the same time in ways that are very familiar to students of this program, you begin to see global networks of loot, theft, accumulation, exploitation, and so on at large centers. Now let me emphasize the question of whether these enterprises are new is itself an extremely complex one. Their practitioners announced them as new, so the English naturalist and administrator Joseph Banks, whose botanical networks you see mapped here this is from the period roughly 1770 to 1810, announced what he was doing as new, even though he knew perfectly well that there were Habsburg, Bourbon, and Jesuit precedents for this going back centuries. There were also, which he knew much less about, um, Ming and Qing precedents for this kind of activity. But he announced this as new, this was a sign of enlightened economic botany. Now one text, I've been trying not to be specific, very specific about bibliography, but I can't resist offering one text as exemplary of the kind of analysis of what the global is in this period, 
that I think does offer really important lessons for historians of science in particular and for historians in general, which is a famous lecture of 1988 by the anthropologist, late and much lamented anthropologist Marshall Salins, um, the Radcliffe Brown lecture that he gave in 1988 on cosmologies of capitalism. So this is a map that I've partly constructed in order to illuminate what was at stake in what Salins was arguing. He focused there on survey projects of Europeans in the Pacific in the final decades of the 18th century, particularly on exchanges between those Europeans and Chinese, Hawaiian, and Kwakwakiwak peoples in respectively the Northwest, the Central North, and the Northeastern Pacific of the time. In his careful interpretation of trade in sandalwood and silk, tea and furs, Salins was keen to show the crucial role of those cultures, those non-European cultures' own sense of value and status and meaning and worth, rather than assuming that all participants must either somehow share the same models of market and trade espoused by the Europeans, or even that that model should be applied to rationalize their activities. No, he said. I quote from him, commodity fetishism is the custom of the capitalist world economy. It's local to that particular system. Its global legitimacy cannot be assumed or even proven. Salins appealed in particular, and this again will be, or will become to be familiar to you, what he called in a rather wonderful way the enormous soft drug culture of 18th century Europe to see why, quote, Asia entered the consciousness of Europe as a cure. Obviously for the English, that means one thing, tea. Precisely because it did so, the specific models of status and of value proper to Asia-Pacific cultures, whether Qing notions of barbarian tribute, or Hawaiian images of chiefly status, or Kwakwakiwak enthusiasm for the distribution of goods in potlatch, could not be dismissed as superstition, or unreason, or epiphenomenal to the intimacies of global circulation. And those kinds of arguments can clearly, and in my view should clearly, be applied to the sciences. It's in the Enlightenment so-called quantifying spirit that one was seemingly supposed to find a powerful model for the global and a threat to its legitimacy. Salins put it like this, just as Galileo thought that mathematics was the language of the physical world, so the bourgeoisie has been pleased to believe that the cultural universe is reducible to a discourse of price, despite the fact that other peoples, for example, these other peoples, would resist one idea and the other by populating their existence with very different considerations. Now one way this matters for the history of science as a way of making sense of the deliberate construction of the global is the attention that is being drawn there, and Stefan was kind enough to mention my interest in this, to the practices and cultures of measurement. So value in both English and French has those two absolutely fascinating, different but connected senses. Absolutely qualitative, absolutely quantitative. 
absolutely universal, absolutely local. And it was in the production of values that the survey sciences, I suggest, helped make the global. It's these kinds of activities and everything that went with them that helped do that. So what I'm showing you here is a set of uh, procedures carried out by the Bourbon, the Royal Spanish Expedition read, led by Alejandro Malaspina into the Eastern Pacific in 1794. This is just before they enter the Pacific, so this is a series of experiments carried out on the Malvinas at the start of 94 on the length of pendulums. In other words, experiments that demonstrate the local force of gravity. And these experiments were carried out globally. They simultaneously defined what it was to coordinate work at a distance in different places, and they defined what the globe was such that those experiments would mean anything. So these are the experiments on the Malvinas in 1794. These are experiments very near the Malvinas in the South Atlantic, uh, carried out by um, Henry Foster, a generation later, and these, the most famous perhaps of the images of these pendulum experiments, were those carried out at Chennai, Madras, in what is now Tamil Nadu in the 1820s in Madras Observatory. You see the Anglo-Danish astronomer John Goldingham, who's a major practitioner of survey sciences. He's the man in the unpromising frock coat with the telescope. Um, the man on standing at the back is Tiruven Kachari, a, a high caste Brahmin who's reading the time. And the man making notes is another high caste Brahmin, Tamil Srinivasachari, who's making notes. And at the back, you see this huge pillar on which the results of the survey are engraved and statements of British ownership of this data are inscribed. Posterity may be informed a thousand years hence of the period when the mathematical sciences were first planted by British liberality in Asia. The observatory doesn't exist anymore and the pillar is in ruins. So this to evoke for you both what survey sciences looked like, how they proposed their kinds of coordination. Obviously, there's a great deal to say about who was involved as practitioner in such sciences. These were not, not at all a European monopoly. And the way in which they both depend on a particular account of what the globe is as well as contributing to it. One very important result of these surveys was the demonstration magnificently that the Earth is not a globe. That is to say, it's not shaped like a sphere. As though, to put it bluntly, the planet became a globe from the scientific point of view exactly when the surveyors showed it wasn't. And that, I think, raises some interesting questions. Now, this reorganization, I'll come to my final point now, of the globe played a familiar and exceptionally important role, not only within the European oikumene, but also, and at least as significantly, in the complex and tense relationships illustrated here established with interlocutors, assistants, subalterns, and experts elsewhere who might have very different models of the global, the planetary, and the cosmos. An excellent example 
is provided by the object on the right here, which is the glass-cased planetarium. It's a model of the universe, both in time and space. It shows the date of creation and the date of the end of the world. It shows the movement of the planets. It shows the movement, the apparent movement of the sun through the sky and of the moon and the local time wherever it is. It was built by a brilliant German pietist clockmaker, Philipp Matthäus Hahn, uh, between 1772 and 1790. He called it the world machine. It's good advertising. Such good advertising that it was bought by the agents of the English East India Company, who then covered it with what they imagined, wrongly, as usual, were Chinese symbols, so that it could be taken to Beijing and offered as a gift to the Qianlong Emperor in exchange for improved rights to trade tea with the Middle Kingdom, the chief aim of the East India Company. In other words, it became tribute from red-haired Western Ocean barbarians, illustrated on the left, <coughs> les peuples tributaires, as part of a particular tribute ceremony in Beijing in 1793. It's an extraordinary palimpsest, a coming together of many different cosmograms, as my colleague and friend John Tresh would put it. When it was presented to the emperor, it was inscribed on what the Chinese officials called, I translate, a list of tribute articles respectfully presented to the mighty emperor of the celestial empire by the king of the red-haired English. It was described as, I quote from the catalogue, this is the Mandarin catalogue, a large construction that consists of the sun, moon, and constellations in the sky, and a complete picture of the globe. On it, the Earth is very small in relation to its actual size. The sun, moon, and stars are fixed to it, together with a replica of the Earth. The whole thing can be set in motion automatically to imitate the motions of the heavens and the earth. It is very realistic." Unquote. So that's the Qing official's description of this thing. The British, on the other hand, had a completely different response from the Qing response. The astronomer charged with managing this show in the Summer Palace recorded in his own journal that the Chinese officials are surprised to find China so small on the terrestrial globe, and some of them imagine that we have made it small on purpose." Unquote. So this is a game of scales. This is a jeu d'échelle in which different judgments at the same moment of the cosmos and the globe are always already judgments about what counts as adequate or realistic scale. And that's the third element, then, of the proposal that I'm trying to develop for you, that survey sciences aided the generation of particular notions of the global because they were so heavily invested in scaling, in the movement between value on the ground, as it were, 
ground truthing value and the values of representation in both senses of value. No doubt one of the finest examples of this kind of scaling contrast is this object. This is a representational copy of a chart made collaboratively between a Tahitian uh, priest navigator named Tupaya from the island of Rayatea in the Society Islands and James Cook and his officers on board resolution on what we're pleased to call James Cook's vo first voyage. And the map was, as you see, rather widely copied and distributed. So this is Georg Forster's copy of the map. It represents, it clearly represents an extraordinarily vast space. The entire space of the Ocean of Islands from Samoa to Rapa Nui to what we, we call Easter Island, Ile de Pâques, and from the Society Islands as far north as Hawaii. And scholars such as Eckstein and Schwartz have shown how to move scale between this map and the maps that Europeans use of the vast area of the central, southern, and north central Pacific. There are many things to say about the negotiations around survey and scale which generated objects like this. But here's one which I find peculiarly interesting. In 1792, the eminent French hydrographer and administrator, Claret de Fleurier, used this work, this map, to make a striking contrast between French and Tahitian survey. Fleurier identified the Ile Marquise, the Marquesas, using the map, argued that, and I quote from Fleurier, sans doute on n'exige pas l'exactitude des cartes de Cook ou de La Perouse dans celle d'un insulaire qui navigue sans moyen pour mesurer la vitesse de son sillage sans instrument pour observer sa latitude. On ne doit pas oublier qu'il n'a aucune idée précise, aucune mesure comparative des distances. So on the one hand, Claret de Fleurier condemns Tupia, as it might seem, because his culture, his locality, is a world of imprecision. He has no instruments, he has no way of making comparison. Yet he makes this map, and this is the map that Fleurier uses. Why? Because Fleurier had complete faith in what he calls l'exactitude de l'hydrographie de Tupia, and much more than in any French mariner, whom Claret de Fleurier criticized because they knew no reliable survey techniques. He argued that it was, c'est le temps de tirer les navigateurs français de l'apathie humiliante qui les retient dans les chaînes d'une vieille routine. So there's an absolutely fascinating chiasmus there, an exchange of properties going on, which completely inverts, in my view, the received model of European immutable mobiles and transient, weaker, indigenous worldviews. On this showing, it's the French who are traditional, bounded, imprecise, hopelessly enslaved to routine. And it is Tupia who is ingenious, improvisatory, exact, and reliable.
Now, there are reasons Claret de Fleurieu makes that argument, but what interests me is that he makes that argument in the 1790s. So, um, I think it's probably time to wind up, you'll be pleased to know. So, let me go more quickly. What I've been arguing is that there is indeed a conjuncture, a coincidence, as it were, at which the sciences of the global and the generation of certain accounts of the globe emerged. But that conjuncture has very different properties depending on how one thinks the history of scaling. This is no doubt by far the most celebrated image of European attempts to scale at a global level. This is the 1805 profile of the Andean peak Chimborazo made by Humboldt, Humboldt and Bonplan uh, for their so-called physique globale. Physique globale is the first science any European called global. And it was invented by Humboldt and his collaborators between the late 1790s and the 1810s. Many scholars have done superb work both on the iconography, that's to say the visual grammar of images like this, and on the intense importance of the relation between European, Creole, and indigenous experts in making objects like this. So what you see on this chart, notoriously and famously, is a simultaneous juxtaposition of the botany, the zoology, above all the arboreal culture, the pressure, the temperature, the height, the concentration of atmospheric electricity, and what Humboldt, I think in a very significant phrase, calls the subterranean meteorology of the entire mountain region of Southern America. That model would then be generalized into global maps, genuinely global maps, that juxtapose together parameters of global extent. In this case, the relation between different climates and different areas of economic production across the planet, as it seemed in the 1820s. So what I've tried to show is the way in which those maps, very familiar as they are, are maps which are built up off of not a self-evident notion of the globe, but a notion and model, a practical material set of models of the globe that were in the process of construction. They make something that they then pretend to represent. That is perhaps the most important take-home lesson of what I've been trying to communicate. The activity of representing what one is in fact making and then announcing that this representation is a description, not a production, is the key, in my view, to understand what is going on in the generation of the global. This matters now in obvious ways, especially if you think about maps like these, because of the climate crisis, above all, perhaps, which is a politics in which we see again and again the way in which data are not given despite the word, that they never speak for themselves, but that they are made and then they are taken. The stories of effortless representation or of self-evident scaling 
in my view, reproduce ways in which that older enlightened utopia was related to a particular rescaling of the world. And like all utopias, it happened not everywhere, but nowhere at all. Thank you. the naturalism of so, uh, um, the globe uh, on both uh, on two different levels for, from the historiographical point of view and from historical point of view. Uh, so uh, we can open the floor for questions if you want. <coughs> en français, si vous voulez. Claret de Fleurieu. Allez-y. Le navigateur français qui va enfoncer les talents de cartographie de Tupaya. Est-ce que ce n'était pas aussi parce qu'il considérait que les Français comme des mauvais navigateurs de manière générale Est-ce que ce n'était pas parce qu'il considérait aussi les Français comme des comme un peuple de mauvais navigateurs et que Ah, un complexe d'infériorité. Um, D'accord. Donc, uh, si vous, uh, si c'est pas, si c'était pas possible d'écouter, la question c'était, est-ce que c'est possible que Clara de Fleurieu a représenté un certain esprit d'infériorité, un complexe d'infériorité vis-à-vis les Polynésiens, c'est ça? Ah, parmi les autres Européens. Vous avez absolument raison, c'est vrai que les interventions de Claré de Fleurieu à ce moment-là, c'est-à-dire au début du, de la guerre révolutionnaire euh, des années 90, euh, il s'agissait d'un certain contraste entre les Anglais et les Français. C'est, c'est absolument vrai. Mais comme j'ai signalé le truc qui m'a, qui m'a passionné, c'est, utilisa- c'est l'utilisation de la figure de Tupaya comme bâton pour, pour ainsi dire, pour inventer un autocritique. Ça, c'est absolument fascinant. Hein? C'est-à-dire pour dénoncer euh, la faillite comparative des modes de navigation français vis-à-vis les Anglais, par exemple. On n'utilise pas les victoires de Cook ou des navigateurs anglais semblables, mais les Polynésiens. Et c'est ça qui est très frappant, parce que, comme j'ai essayé de vous montrer, la carte de Tupin demande... Euh, par les arpenteurs marines, l'interprétation très, très difficile de le comprendre, de définir, par exemple, le lieu où se trouvent les îles marquises, ce n'est pas évident en soi. C'est exactement ce que Claré de Fleurier a réussi à faire. Donc, euh, vous avez absolument raison, bien entendu. C'était un critique des Français vis-à-vis les autres Européens. Mais ce qui est intéressant pour moi, c'est l'utilisation des insulaires. J'espère que c'était 
by photography in the 18th century, especially in uh, anthropology and also in uh, classic physics in the mid-40s, uh, as uh, also in the history of sciences, change, uh, changes the way um, the way they represent uh, spaces or or uh, I guess spaces. Oh, my question <laughs> to be more clear is: Do the image in the history of science with the new te techniques changes um, like the, the historiography? Yes. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. That's a brilliant point, right? Um, it seems to me to be obvious that different ensembles of representational technique come with different models of scale and different accounts of and relations with the global extent of the material, the data, the phenomena, and the objects, and indeed, as you're pointing out, the people who are involved in that. That seems kind of very, very clear, right? It's precisely for that reason that it's extremely difficult, I should have thought, to progress the historical study of the generation of the global within the sciences without resources from the history of art. That seems kind of obvious, right? On the other hand, I was, I was going to say at the same time, but I'm not going to say that. On the other hand, um, there is what we might call a professional deformation going on there, which is the terrible mistake of supposing that new of that new representational regimes completely displace older ones. That is not what we see within the history of the sciences. Do you see what I mean there? That for example, let me see if I can bring up the image. This is not going to be easy, is it? I'll try. It's not going to work, is it? No. I have to do it all over again. Never mind. Um, for example, you're absolutely right that the development of photographic registration from the 1830s and 40s massively changes the information order of the way the global is pictured and made and accounted for. But that does not mean that all pre-photographic representational technologies vanish. What is so interesting is the hybridization of forms in which photography and print and engraving and mapping and indeed work with three-dimensional objects all continue together. And I have some images which I can't show you because I can't make this work, of exactly that process in operation, right? So you're clearly right, but one must not therefore, as it were, call the period that I've been talking about the age of engraving, which is then displaced by an age of photography, which is then displaced by an age of the numérique or whatever. That's not what's happening here, not at all, right? Um, and I think that raises interesting questions, very interesting questions, which will be discussed in this series in several of the talks, especially the one in April, um, about the coexistence and conversation between different regimes of visuality. I hope that makes sense. Ma'am, 
Um, yes, to the first point, absolutely. Um, so the obvious examples would be um, early Ming surveys from our late 15th, early 16th century, right? Um, and there are several other examples of surveys of the known world that have nothing to do with Europeans, right? In South Asia, in several of the South American and Central American regimes. In fact, one could argue that that's rather how the state sees, to quote a very well-known text, um, that I mean, James Scott's analysis of seeing like a state needs to incorporate that cosmological global sense. It's a very important aspect of uh, what it is to be engaged in state building of, of that sort, and not just states, right? So the very long comparative and connected histories of cosmological representation on which I am certainly no expert at all um, show that this is not at all a European monopoly, but, and this is a very big but, in the episodes that I was discussing, for example, the encounter between Han's planetarium and the Qing court, the Qianlong Emperor and his courtiers, what you see there is both a complicated encounter but also a certain kind of effacement, of rubbing out, of rendering invisible. Because from the East India Company side, from the British side, it seemed absolutely clear that they were bringing to Beijing an unprecedented object, an object for which there was no Chinese equivalent. And that's nonsense. But it was very important, right? The, this very intriguing plan that the company had to offer up to the Qing emperor, to the Qianlong emperor, a representation of the whole world, not just in space, but also in time, right, um, was taken by the company astronomers to be something simultaneously that the Chinese would find astonishing and that they would not have. And as we learned, neither of those assumptions is true. Right? It's very familiar, it is very realistic, right? Um, and they weren't interested. So the relation between European, I mean this is too simple, but you see what I'm, where I'm going. The relation between European and non-European acts of representation of the globe as such are not only relations of uh, interlocution, they're also relations of effacement, right? And hence the significance, it goes back to the first question of Tupaya's map, right? The scale of Tupaya's map is both a resource and a shock, right? Very much for that. Uh, a few years back, I did some work on the UNESCO history of mankind, and so listening to you, it suddenly rang a bell, and I thought it was really obvious why, uh, at the beginning, global history or world history started with the history of science. And so, I mean, it's just a kind of comment, but I thought it, it was really interesting, and so it's. The, the subject behind this is the relationship between the history of science and global history. So at the beginning, uh, uh, world history originated in the history of science. Exactly. And I was wondering how you see it today. No, that's an absolutely 
I mean, A, that's clearly right, isn't it? Um, that many of the practitioners and protagonists, I mean, you're the expert, but many of the protagonists, so I understand it, of the initiatives of the 1940s and 50s um, to produce what we might call equitable global history use the history of the sciences in a fascinating way to guarantee equity, to guarantee a certain kind of liberal humanism. On the Anglophone side, these are figures like Jacob Bronowski, Joseph Needham, and Julian Huxley, um, and I would say especially Joseph Needham, right, who is of course an indispensable figure in the stories that I've been telling because of the strange relationship, I mean for many reasons frankly, but one is because of the strange relationship between an insistence on exceptionalism and an insistence on universalism. One reason why I began by pointing out the role that the global plays in the received epistemology of the sciences. The sciences must be global and they must not be local, right? So they must be universal and they must, in this very strange way, be simultaneously particular and not. So do you make a distinction between global and universal? Absolutely, yes as Needham does. Yeah. Because for Needham, <laughs> am I talking about someone who's familiar or someone who's not known? Can I assume you know who Joseph Needham is? Let's go and connaît Joseph Needham. Oui, non, peut-être. Il faut que j'explique un petit peu. D'accord. He was born in 1900. That's very easy to remember. Um, he was a brilliant English, very, biochemist who in the 1930s and then massively in the 1940s traveled to, lived in, fought in, and eventually became entirely absorbed by the emergence and development of what he thought of as Chinese science and civilization. And from 1952 until his death in 1993, he led and mainly wrote a vast multi-volume history of science and civilization in China, which was originally going to be seven volumes and has just reached its 46th volume, I think, something like that. The reason Needham matters partly to the story that we're discussing here is because he was a major protagonist in the early years of UNESCO, insisting on what one might call a post-European rather than a non-European history, not just of the sciences, but of civilizations in general. Partly because he was extraordinarily committed to a distinction between the global and the universal. What he meant and what therefore I mean by that distinction is roughly as follows. For Needham, the global is a process. It's the result of certain long-term, long-range processes of exchange and diffusion, diffusion. So that the task of the global historian, confusingly, from that point of view, is to trace the pathways by which, and this was the metaphor that he always used, each local national river flowed into the sea of knowledge, 
and civilization. So that was the model, and that informed a huge amount of UNESCO. You're absolutely right. Surely that informed a huge amount of the 1940s and early 50s project to write a kind of global history of knowledge and culture. Right? The universal, on the other hand, is not a process. The universal is the fundamental moral property for him and others, like Huxley, of this shared global culture that has emerged as the result of history. So the global produces, as we might say, the universal, and the universal is the condition for the global working. Without the universal, Needham argued, it would not have been possible for very different societies to converge as they, he argued, have done. Right? And that's a really important political distinction for a certain liberal humanist politics at the beginning of the Cold War, I would argue. Right? I think that that's roughly what was going on there. Right? And the re finally, the reflexive aspect of that is the effect of that distinction on certain kinds of historiographies of science, right? Which is why I keep on coming back to this kind of double point of an insistence on the um, universal scope of science's claims and yet at the same time an insistence on the special qualities of the sites at which the sciences are pursued. Right? Both of those things have to be in play. Right? But yes, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to uh, Humboldt's profile of Chimborazo and have a question of, uh, concerning the representation. And you, you told us that it was like a juxtaposition of different knowledge from like local people and urban scientists. And I just wanted to know Um, that's such a great question. Um, so I'm drawing on the work of uh, particularly Jorge Cañizares Esguera, who is a great scholar of uh, Latin American, Creole, New World sciences and politics, and who has written a very important suite of analyses of Humboldt's reliance on and relation with Creole and indeed indigenous informants and collaborators. I'm also drawing on the work there of a younger scholar, Patrick Anthony, who has studied this set of relations in the particular case of mining in New Spain, in Mexico, and also in New Granada, in um, northern Peru and Colombia. Um, on the one hand, beneath, almost literally beneath the surface of Humboldt's surveys, is a vast amount of already existing knowledge and expertise. Some of it very informal to do with indigenous practices of what we might call diagnosis, so recognizing the properties of particular minerals or plants, the relation between geographical distribution of one group of plants and another, all of that was absolutely fundamental for what Humboldt and Bonplan did. As part of their physique du globe, what they set out to do was to produce what they called, or what Humboldt called, a physiognomie de la nature, which was the name Humboldt gave to 
the characterization of entire populations of flora and fauna. That this range of plants and animals would always be found together. And therefore certain kinds of appearance in nature were locally characteristic and they could be mapped and they would contribute to a physique du globe. But that knowledge is not Humboldt's knowledge. That knowledge was indigenous and Creole knowledge. That's absolutely not what Humboldt, as it were, ocularly observed. On the other hand, um, as Canizares Esguera points out, very, 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 very few of these others appear at all in Humboldt's work. It's only historians now who can recover what this work was and who was responsible for it. That, of course, is an extremely familiar theme in South Asian natural history, in indigenous astronomy, in Latin American scientific surveys in general, and I would say above all in southern and central Africa. This is a very familiar theme. The indispensable and the invisible often go together. I could go on and on about this, but I'll try not to. One more point, finally, about your question would be the following. I closed my talk with the observation that a key to survey science is the production of a representation and the claim that all one has done is represent, one has not made anything. Right? That one has in fact constructed a system and then it's pictured and then one says, I just made a picture of it. Right? Now that set of claims is always also a kind of effacement Labor, in that sense, the hard work of making, is often taken to be a weakness in the adequacy of a representation. So my colleagues Peter Gallison and Lorraine Daston call that mechanical objectivity. Mechanical objectivity is the notion that you should believe what I'm saying because I did nothing. I'm just showing. And it's very interesting to reflect on what is left out, what is rubbed out, what is gome, when one sees mechanical objectivity in operation. What is left out is labor, and not only one's own labor. Okay. And that, it seems to me, is what we see in the Humboldt image. <coughs> right? Almost all the work has been very carefully disappeared, and not just his own. Right? the scientific agenda but also political agenda and listening to you I was wondering whether it would be possible to make particularly for the, the, the recent uh, decades it would be possible to make a global history of local knowledge 
And, and I was wondering whether you know uh, the maps of Lumisa Marti. Yes. Uh, so I, I said so for, the, so for the audience, uh, she is a national li linguist and she has represented the world uh, through its diversity. And she's tried to make a, um, a connection between uh, the linguistic diversity and biological diversity. So that's another way of representing the world. And I think that's, that could be an hypothesis that uh, maybe we are entering a world where we are able to represent that diversity, cultural diversity. And so that maybe you could comment on this. I'm a huge admirer of Murphy's project. Um, and obviously, you will have thought in much more detail than I could ever do about how one might represent locality and diversity differently. In other words, on the one hand, there is a certain pessimism in the story that I've been trying to tell because I've associated attempts to represent, to bring to presence a global view and the globe itself as a deeply, deeply um, arrogant and uh, often exploitative set of practices at a very particular moment of imperial, colonial, economic and social crisis between 1789 and 1815. And that is rather pessimistic and gloomy because it's as though generating the global comes with the kind of interests and concerns that we've just been talking about in the Humboldtian case. The effacement of the local or its exploitation, or its expropriation. And as you will know better than I do, the category of TEK, of traditional environmental knowledge, itself is highly controversial for exactly that reason, right? Um, because it sounds as if what we are talking about is a certain process of commodification, after all, right? Which fits exactly into what I was talking about earlier. On the other hand, one cannot and should not be so pessimistic. There are, and there must be, and there really exist, clearly, very, very different ways of registering and bringing together different kinds of locality without either effacing or simply expropriating the forms of world making that I was talking about here. What would be significant, which is why I think Murphy's work is so splendid, to be honest with you, is who has the agency to make those accounts? Who, one can say this in French, but it's harder to say it in English, who signs the map? literally, who signs the map. I mean, what's interesting about images like the Humboldtian ones that we were just looking at is that they are either unambiguously signed by Humboldt or they are associated with him or they are anonymous. Those are the only alternatives. And the model of distributed and collective authorship is not apparent in the material that I've been talking about. And it is apparent in, I think, more progressive and potentially liberating forms of picturing and representation and indeed intervention now, right? And no doubt that would take us a very long way away from the category of traditional environmental knowledge, right? Because traditional environmental knowledge, just as Salin says, seems to some of us to use the criteria uh, 
of the exploiter in order to justify what in looked at from one point of view needs no justification at all quite the opposite I mean it the it's all the other way around right as Salin says it's physics on the one side and teleology on the other right um, and that can't be a useful model for historians or activists or historian activists either right so that would be my first response there's clearly a great deal to say there notably and again you must be the expert in areas of ecological struggle and conflict which are the most important at the moment and also in areas where as we said towards the end there data works just in case its origin is rendered invisible right? the more bizarrely the more attention is paid to the long chains through which data reaches us weirdly it gets less powerful we have to reverse that assumption somehow and I think what Murphy and others are doing is amazing from that point of view right because you can trace what is at stake there and that's what signature really must mean right that would be my response I don't know if that's any use at all Yeah. Where she proposes to uh, study the ethnic, to make an ethnography of uh, global connections and to see in uh, specific specific sites where we can see the tensions between so in localized sites uh, the tension between uh, this ideology of the universal and this ideology of the, the local. And I think that's a quite a productive uh, way of doing it without going through the map. I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Although I'm very nostalgic about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so it's very late, so we we'll probably uh, have to end uh, the discussion if there is uh, no other question. And ce que je voudrais indiquer, c'est deux toutes petites choses. Je suis très reconnaissant parce que je sais très bien que c'est toujours difficile de suivre euh, une argumentation en anglais parce que c'est pas une langue pour faire des idées claires et, et distinctes c'est une langue empiriste hein. c'est pas du tout une langue cartésienne donc euh, je m'excuse la deuxième chose c'est que Stéphane possède une chose rarissime, c'est mon adresse email. <rire> Donc, si l'esprit d'escalier entre dans votre esprit, euh, vous pouvez très, très, très volontiers euh, m'envoyer un message et je vais essayer de répondre euh, parce que j'ai le temps. Right. Euh, parce que je vais prendre ma retraite dans deux semaines. Right. Uh, donc, uh, ça sera assez facile. C'est inédit. Hein? <laughs> uh, donc, si vous avez uh, l'espoir de communiquer une chose uh, un peu plus personnelle, ça va. Et merci. merci.